So here's a quick video, because I was asked the other day, what's the difference between the Taliban and the Mujahideen? Um, and the Mujahideen were fighting against the Soviets, and the Taliban have been fighting against the Americans, the NATO forces, both in Afghanistan, and there are links between the two. And uh, it seems to me that it's very uncertain, um, and uh, Western media, when it's reporting on this, is often a little bit vague and cuts corners in the story. So, um, towards the end of the Soviet invasion, uh, the period when the Soviet Union was in Afghanistan, six million women and children had gone abroad. Um, and these refugee children are the ones who would end up being indoctrinated into the Taliban. In 1979, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan with military superiority, um, and they were doing so um, as defenders of the then communist rulers. Um, the People's Democratic Party of, of Afghanistan, led by two people, Nur Mohammed Taraki and uh, Babruk Kamal. Now, the communists, in turn, had themselves staged a bloody coup against the nation's first president, Mohammed Daoud Khan, in 1978, so just one year earlier. And Khan himself had overthrown his cousin, King Sahir Shah, in 1973, abolishing the monarchy then, and he had named himself president, also in a military coup. So there's a series of violent acquisitions and loss of power. And um, Khan set up his own constitution. So the excuse... Um, for the Soviet invasion was rivalry between uh, Taraki, the president, and a man called uh, Hafizullah Amin, one of the other influential Communist Party leaders. And in the course of the fighting, the US um, ambassador, Adolf Dubbs, was killed. And this led the US uh, to stopping aid being sent to Afghanistan, uh, and shortly afterwards, Taraki himself was also assassinated. Um, now, after the Soviets invaded, Amin um, was executed, and uh, Babrak Amin was confirmed as the Prime Minister. So quite a complex um, transfer of power. Um, what is also perhaps important is to recognise that Afghanistan was simply one of the many stands that surrounds uh, the lower portion of Russia. So Russia, whether it likes to be seen um, or not, at that period, the Soviet um, Russia was an imperial power and had its own colonies, and the colonies were the stands and it reasoned that Afghanistan should be brought directly under its own control. And this, of course, never really happened. But equally, Afghanistan has a history that goes all the way back into the British Empire. It was the British that divided, formally divided, Afghanistan from Pakistan. And the line that they drew went straight through the middle of the Pashtun tribe, which is why many Pashtuns are found in Pakistan and also in Afghanistan and may, in many senses, not respect that border. Today, Pakistan has put up a fence along that border. But it explains why Pashtuns, particularly those associated with the Taliban, have happily crossed from one side of the border to the other. For the majority of people, there is only one route from Pakistan into Afghanistan, and that is the famous Khyber Pass that was used by the British back in the 19th century. It was also used 
by the Americans bringing things in to modern Afghanistan. It is the only um, roadway from Pakistan into Afghanistan. But the Taliban have many uh, exits and entrances along that border through the mountain ranges. It's a very porous border, but only if you know the lie of the land. For most of us, there is only one route in and out of Afghanistan, unless we choose to use an airport. This is why the loss of the airport, um, this is why the loss of the military airport, and then um, uh, the surrounding of the civil airport in Kabul was so um, destructive in the latest attack. Um, and, and, and this was why this was so instrumental in the downfall of the Afghan government and um, the success of the Taliban. Russia brought in um, enormous tanks, jets, artillery um, and attacked the anti-communist government forces of the Mujahideen. Um, but of course, the Mujahideen were um, everywhere and nowhere. There was no central command. And, and, and you know, from the point of view of a war, there was no way to negotiate um, a diplomatic solution. So the Mujahideen fought a long guerrilla war in the mountains, um, and they could strike at will and then retreat into the caves and disappear. Uh, and Soviet tanks and military vehicles, no matter how brilliant they were, simply could not pursue. Even jets were completely useless. The guerrillas, uh, for example, watched the flight patterns of birds, and if they saw a, a huge flock of birds suddenly appearing, uh, they knew that Russian jets were on the way. There was only one uh, decent uh, p p p p piece of equipment that, um, uh, that, that had any effect, and that was the $10 uh, million dollar top-of-the-range helicopter designed in 1972 uh, called the Letoyoshkia, or flying tank, the Mil-24 gunship. Uh, this, this was the only weapon that worked effectively and that the Soviets um, could deploy against the guerrilla forces. They had 250 of them uh, in Afghanistan, though the number, uh, you know, the, many different sources will give different um, numbers for the strength of the um, of, 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 of the of, of this um, equipment, how many how, how how many helicopters the Russians had? Um, there seems to have been a force of about eight hundred uh, helicopters over the period of the um, of the Russian invasion. Invasion. Um, it, this um, this helicopter had a large rotary cannon that could attack, and it was heavy enough to withstand the basic uh, rifle um, power that the uh, Mujahideen deployed. Um, uh, of course, once the US started supplying the Mujahideen with uh, Stinger surface-to-air missiles, the Mil-24 gunship was doomed. And the Mujahideen, at one point, were taking out one or two of these um, flying tanks every day. Uh, and so by 1985, it was quite clear to the Russians, to the Soviets, that the war could not go on. Now, who were the Mujahideen? Generally, they were just ordinary people, farmers from the countryside. They were uh, um, uh, uh, agricultural workers. Um, and they would go back to their daily life once they'd finished fighting. Um, and uh, two things happened over the period of this very long and very brutal war. The first was um, the Russians... Uh, under Gorbachev, this man um, that, that we know in the West as the man who um, arranged the end of the, or presided over the end of the Soviet Union, the man who actually um, gained a, a, a Nobel Peace Prize, he was the person who made the decision uh, that all society, not just the fighters, not just these guerrilla fighters, should be treated as combatants. And um, Gorbachev arranged for villages as a whole to be bombed, industrial sites as a whole to be attacked, 
livestock to be destroyed, um, everything, farmlands to be mined, uh, and, uh, and it's that mining thing which is so um, aggressive. There, there, there was one particular mine, um, the Soviet toy mine, um, which did enough damage to maim a child, not to kill a child. Um, and this, the Soviets believed, put pressure on families and stopped um, fathers particularly going into battle. Injured families could not put up resistance. Um, this was particularly brutal, but it was one way of waging a campaign against a guerrilla force. So during this period, the, um, uh, the, the Afghan people moved from the um, farms into the cities and uh, Kabul's population tripled. Um, and millions at the same time fled to Pakistan and to Iran, and many of these were children. The men stayed behind to defend their country. And in the absence of their families, of their women and children, uh, you know, they suffered serious psychological damage. Um, in Pakistan, the Pakistani city of Peshawar uh, was involved in fundraising, um, collecting volunteers, uh, you know, recruiting, recruiting soldiers to go back into Afghanistan and fight the Soviets. And during this period, the, um, the, the various factions multiplied in Afghanistan. Uh, at one point, 80 different groups were fighting the Soviets. And we tend to call these the Mujahideen. But um, again, there is no leadership. There is no single coherent um, force with whom anybody could negotiate. And they were funded by a multiplicity of different agencies. A lot of funding came from uh, a Pakistani group called the Inter-Services Intelligence, the ISI. Now the ISI was also funded by the US and Saudi Arabia. So this is how you get the money, the weapons, the volunteers, um, how, how you get some sort of structure, but it doesn't completely cover um, the way the Mujahideen was um, functioning. Um, each little group of these 80 claimed stronger and stronger leadership and stronger adherence to Islamic values. So by the time you get to the end of the 1980s, the Mujahideen are so competing with each other to see who can be the more zealous, who can be the more Muslim. Uh, and at the same time, the groups were becoming fragmented. They were also involved in sort of warlord activity and finding any ways they could to make money, which is where you get the development of the drug trade. Uh, by 1988, the Soviets had decided to retreat. And the government in Kabul um, attempted to reach a peace deal and failed. In 1992, the Mujahideen attacked Kabul uh, and then fought among themselves. And uh, the Soviets have gone and the Mujahideen turned um, their attacks on each other, and there was um, chaos. Uh, many, many, many um, sovereignties emerged across the country, uh, extorting um, the ordinary citizens, um, dealing with drugs, um, theft, rape, attacks. Um, people were not safe. This was um, the Wild West. Um, and at the same time, children who had earlier gone to the refugee camps in Pakistan were, um, you know, they had no freedom. So their only sense of release was to go to the local um, madrasas, the local Pakistani madrasas, which themselves had been funded by Saudis. And there was um, a particular Wahhabi uh, tradition 
imported from Saudi Arabia, which was being taught in these madrasas. So the madrasas, uh, in the madrasas, two things were being taught only. Um, Self-defense or combat, and a very, very specific form of Islamic ideology, um, which comes from uh, Saudi Arabia. So this was free education, and, um, and, and it was free military training. And at one point there were 2,000 madrasas in Pakistan, and 20, uh, 220,000, I think, children passing through this system. And these, these children were cut off from the outside world and open to whatever indoctrination was being provided by uh, these madrasas. They believed, by the time they came out of these schools, they believed that they were the guardians of Islam, that they were destined to set up a perfect state uh, it was an apocalyptic narrative, a terrifying narrative. And when the Taliban, Taliban simply means students, um, when, the, when these students took power, they um, implemented, uh, implemented all these ideas of um, uh, Wahhabi uh, extremism. Re remember that Islam, although it seems very straightforward, although there is a very clear book. Um, there are also uh, a lot of supporting books called the Hadiths um, and, and, and other material as well. So how you interpret the Holy Quran is very much dependent on which Hadiths you are reading and which teachers you are following. And, and, and indeed, even in the Quran itself, there are certain verses which one, which one might emphasize and certain verses one might not emphasize. Um, Wahhabism is uh, takes a very extreme approach. And when you mix that, or, or when you don't mix that with any form of secular education at all, so these students had no other education except for what they had learnt in the madrasas. This seems to me to be very worrying indeed. One of the first times we hear of the Taliban is an expedition by Mullah Omar, who takes some of these students into Afghanistan, and they are uh, victorious in their, um, in, in their efforts. Um, Mullah Omar's initiative was applauded, um, and uh, he also received support from uh, the Pakistani authorities and from the CIA and training. In 1994, uh, the Mujahideen checkpoints at the Pakistani border were attacked by the Taliban. Um, and, and remember, by this time, the Mujahideen really were warlords from the Wild West and drug barons. Um, the Mujahideen were attacked, and cheaper goods could suddenly reach the markets in Kabul and in the cities. Uh, the Taliban easily took Kandahar, and there they took the weapons and the tanks left behind by the Soviets. Um, and Pakistan, at about the same time, opened up the refugee camps uh, in, in Pakistan, and the, ta and the um, Afghan refugees were free to go back over the border into Afghanistan. Now, the Taliban drove out the Mujahideen um, from the majority of rural Afghanistan, and they approached Kabul. In September 1996, uh, suddenly, in Kabul, the streets were being patrolled by um, men wearing black turbans speaking a different dialect. Uh, to the one that uh, the people in Afghanistan knew. And um, they could see they had odd religious training. And, and, and this became uh, more noticeable. The ordinary Afghans had swapped one intolerable rule, 
these um, fighting warlords for another, uh, a, um, a systemized government um, by zealots who were saying that women were forbidden to have any form of public life. Uh, music, photographs, TV, films, all banned. Gambling was banned. Pets were forbidden. Um, and, and, and traditional Afghan customs like kite flying, completely forbidden. Uh, at the same time, beards were compulsory and um, women had to be fully covered, the burqa. Um, not praying at the appropriate time was punished. Uh, and, and punishments were public, public floggings, public executions, mass intimidation. And uh, by 1998, there was another little group um, which had, uh, it, it, its leader had been involved in some form in the funding of the Mujahideen. But this fringe Afghan Arab group was called Al-Qaeda or the base, or the foundation. And it declared war in 1998 on America. Um, and uh, America, in turn, uh, once its embassies had been attacked around the world, asked Pakistan for help. But by this time, Pakistan had lost control of the Taliban. Uh, also, uh, the um, that uh, agency which was uh, w w which had been funding the Taliban, the ISI, was now full of Taliban sympathisers at a very low bureaucratic level. So very difficult to rein in control for Pakistan. So Islamabad was unable to act against the Taliban, and and. In many cases, um, the Taliban commanded sympathy in Pakistan. Uh, the rival Mujahideen um, groups um, were assassinated. And in 2001, um, which is just, just before the 9-11 event, in 2001, the 6th century uh, Bamiyan Buddha statues were destroyed. Now, um, I, I, I see that as a decisive event uh, for me, the destruction of religious and historical artifacts demonstrates uh, that the Taliban, like um, later uh, zealot organizations like um, ISIS um, and Daesh, uh, were, 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 were cherry-picking from um, Islamic traditions. As there's a tradition of Ibra, uh, it's very, very clear in the Ottoman Empire that, um, that one doesn't destroy the older buildings and um, older religious sites because um, one measures one's own success against the history one mustn't destroy history, otherwise one has no way of measuring one's own success. Uh, also one has respect for other people's traditions. Um, the Taliban doesn't. And so at the end of 2001, we see the launching of the Al-Qaeda attack on the US, and the NATO comes into Afghanistan and seizes the country very quickly um, on October the 7th, 2001, and um, instates its new president within a few days. Now, the current Taliban leaders, um, um, most, most of them have been based uh, during the... Um, during the American and NATO invasion, they've been based in Doha. Uh, people like Abdul Ghani Barada. And they say now that they're going to return to the constitution set up in the 1960s by the nation's last king, 
Muhammad Zahir Shah. Um, and this was, this was a constitution set up um, in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, one of the things that the Taliban have said is that they're no longer going to rely on drug trade. So the drug trade of the uh, Mujahideen dash uh, Afghan warlords will stop. So we will be able to measure whether or not that's true. They also say that they're going to respect women. Again, Islam is a religion that makes it very clear, particularly in the fourth surah of the Quran, that men and women are equal. So this would be a very positive uh, thing to see. Um, uh, there's also, um, you know, uh, there, are, there, there, there is an option um, to, 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 to do some serious trading with mineral deposits in the, in the um, mountains, particularly lithium. Um, and, uh, and it's, so, so, so the Taliban would need to find a new source of revenue if it's, if it's not going to rely on opium, um, because there was a huge, a huge, um, I, I think four, $416 million worth um, of revenue was brought in for the Taliban each year from the poppy harvests. Uh, and so we need to take, we need to take particular care um, about what um, uh, Zabihullah uh, Mullahid, the, uh, the um, Taliban spokesman, actually said. Uh, on the 17th of this month, uh, this is what he said, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to quote, um, we would like to assure you that nobody is going to knock on their door to inspect you, to inspect them, to ask them or to interrogate them as to who uh, they have been working for or interpreting for. So I would like to assure you that no harm is going to be done. They're going to be safe. And yet at the same time, we have very clear reports that the Taliban are going from door to door. And certainly from uh, the friends that I have, in Afghanistan, um, I get a distinct feeling that there is um, universal worry that anybody who has been involved in any form of association with the West is in danger. So we have two, we have two, um, two situations. We have what the Taliban say they're going to do, and we have the reports which are slowly trickling out, which suggest that they're actually back to the same tricks. Um, we've seen uh, posters of women painted over already. We've seen um, women in burqas moving around in the streets in photographs. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, the Taliban spokesperson is calling on women to be a part of the new government. Is talking about an inclusive government. And as I say, we wait to see whether or not that will happen. This is independent of the need, I think a moral need, for America and the West to um, offer support and to, and to arrange flights for anybody who is working for them or for us. Um, in whatever capacity. Um, that, I think, is, um, is our moral duty. And um, to talk at the moment about delays in processing visa applications is cheap. Our first duty is to get these people out. And we should be taking advantage of um, offers like the one made by Eddie Rama, the president of, um, the, the prime minister of uh, Albania um, and, um, and, st and, and placing people in a third country if necessary while their paperwork is checked. But um, we should, we, we, we should recognise that now is not the time um, to suddenly become pompous and arrogant because the carpet has been pulled from under us 
and we look untrustworthy, we look cheap, and frankly, I think we look rather dirty. But there we are. Um, that's a sort of explanation. I hope that's of some use.